gemeinigheid ook eraan deel aan die willig. Many thanks to the president for his kind invitation to these mysteries. Over 50 years ago, we used to do the politics program seven days every Monday night on RTE. We were off the air for the summer, and I was on holiday in Camp County Kerry. When on August the 20th, 1968, the Warsaw Pact countries, led by the Soviet Union, rolled tanks and troops into Czechoslovakia, into Prague, to end their f gentle freedoms and J Dubček's reforms. I remember lying out to get a signal in those starlit nights listening to news on shortwave radio from New York, to the meetings of the United Nations. The Czech plenipotentiary came to plead with his global compatriots to come to their aid. On that crackly radio, his voice was urgent and emotional. And his words were most affecting. I was riveted. I could see those tanks, the horror of the people, the suddenness. It is still an unforgettable moment for me, the shock of war. What would it have been like more than 50 years earlier on radio to hear when the gunboat Helga came up the Liffey to put an end to our declaration of free and independent republic? There was no United Nations to appeal to. Few enough to hear, except by word of mouth, that fearful, poetic, and strangely elated moment. Most people were unaware. There were no moving cameras to follow every awesome moment. James Stevens walked the streets to and from his office, writing about what he saw in his simple, graphic, calm way. Maura Comerford circled the cut-off city, enchanted and frustrated. The rising, the risen people. It's an emotional image. I would have been as riveted by the dream of those passionate poets and unexpected soldiers, and as caught up in those later moments of ghastly retribution, the executions. They changed everything. And then the War of Independence, the treaty and its debates. What would it have been like to see the four courts under siege, the tragedy of comrade against comrade, and our emerging slightly free state, the amputated north of Ireland, a League of Nations reject. Few phones, little radio, but Morse code. Photographers, yes, aplenty, and contending headlines and propaganda. In 1908, Michael Collins, then 18 years old, sat in the London offices of the British Civil Service opposite my father, a boy clerk like him, and two years his junior. Michael was already a member of the IRB, the secret Fenian army who rose from the famine and became the brotherhood that finally created what Noel O'Connell, O'Fuelon, called our damp little shambles of a democracy. But there was no public medium to help us know the hopes of all those Irish language <coughs> and literary enthusiasts, the trade unionists and suffragettes, those young military and sports people. What did they have in common? How were we to know? What are their aims? Were their aims compatible? What were everybody's aspirations? The women of the Citizen Army and volunteers, the suffrage movement, and the majority of common among members had the bad manners to believe in the rhetoric and ideas of the proclamation and in the domestic program. They believed that the Republic would be built on new Irish structured organizations and systems to suit the innate creativity and eccentric idealism of the uh, Irish, different from English bureaucracy maybe, with a more open spirituality based on an earlier, less misogynistic Catholicism and the century old generation, generosity of broad swathes of Irish citizens. But those men who had survived the rising and terms in prison described these womenly bad manners as shrill and unbending. With the existence of a contemporary, media have offered a different view. Maybe I'm foolish to believe that the inclusion of a woman among the plenipotentiaries could have led to a more generally acceptable outcome. What about the involvement of figures like Mary McSweeney in the treaty negotiations? Her intellect and force of character, or the down-to-earth imperiousness of the Countess, might have resisted the bullying of Churchill and Birkenhead 
and the wiliness of Lloyd George, of Lloyd, yeah, yeah, him. Mary McSweeney's grandnephew, Cahill McSweeney Brewer, spoke about his aunt in a recent documentary. He revealed that she had wanted to go to London for the negotiations, but people like Collins and Griffith rejected her. Too argumentative. It did not take long for women's role in the revolution as messengers, combatants, spies and intelligent officers, dispatch riders, jailbirds, organisers of rallies and protests, hunger strikers, writers, educators and full-time providers of safe houses to be scrubbed from the record until a new generation of scholars and historians led by the likes of Margaret McCurtain, Margaret Ward and others began to set the record straight. No mass media at work there to balance the record until after the events. For instance, it was last May when the opportunity first occurred to see and taste the dreams and heartbreak of seven of the seven women survivors of the leaders in the documentary on RTE, Forgotten, Widows of the Irish Revolution. Shea Mary Doyle's The Rebel Doctor has kept alive for us the life's work of Kathleen Lynn, great saviour of poor children and their penniless mothers. So how in earlier times were those days and aspirations conveyed to citizens? Four years after the end of the Civil War, the independent Irish radio station 2RN went on air. Situated high up in the shoulder of the GPO, it became Radio Éireann, within the Department of Posts and Telegraphs, beloved of farmers for weather forecasts, and saving the dry battery for Michal O'Hare and the great pictures he made of hurling matches. Dear to those who loved the radio play on a Sunday night, the poultry instructor, and the making and mending man. Later, in the early 50s until 1964, Gwey Lynn, the inventive Irish language promoters, produced a fortnight newsreel of Irish life, Avark Éireann, by Colm O'Leary and with Jim Mulkerns. They were so popular that the Rank Film Organisation agreed to show the newsreels in all of their cinemas. Gwaylin was one of those who offered their services to run an Irish television service earlier. They were unsuccessful. The state's belief in the efficacy of the advanced factory idea led to the establishment of Ardmore Studios in 1958 to welcome American films and to promote the Abbey Theatre and Irish actors. It was the brainchild of Emmett Dalton, recovered veteran of the Civil War, Michael Collins's friend. It was less welcome to Irish filmmakers and activists like Louis Marcus and Tiernan McBride, who thought supporting Ireland's own filmmakers should be our first priority. One of the big early films there in 1959 was Shake Hands with the Devil, action film from a 1933 uh, novel by Reardon Connor. It was set in the War of Independence at the start of the Black and Tan era and it ended in the truce. It was an undeniably pro-treaty document showing that the anti-treaty argument was far too unrealistic, far too extreme. No word about any socialist dimension to those days, however. In a sense, that was left to Searsha. Freedom with a question mark. George Morrison's monumental tragic sequel to 19, in 1961 to the more hopeful Misha era with Sean O'Reilly's majestic music. And then, that same year, 1961, Irish television. Understandably, as with the earlier thinking of Collins and Griffith, and then De Valera and John Charles McQuaid, in 1959, Michael Hilliard was able to declare in Doyle, this television service will not be run by Beelzebub, but by nine responsible people. No irony that the nine responsible people were eight men and one woman, at least better than the Council of State, where there was not a single woman in 1966. You can see the photograph of it in the parlour here. Nevertheless, as in literature, there were enough creative souls to draw attention to the anomalies and corruptions as well as to the marvels of the state. The absolutist position of the religious, political and cultural elites who looked after censorship of films and books policing and imprisoning of young pregnant women in loveless institutions and young men in industrial so-called schools 
and the villainy of corrupt politicians and businessmen became slowly more obvious to the watching public. Mary Raftery on TV, Marion Finucane, and Katie Hannan on radio, among others, have told the hard truths about our democracy. In general, though, as with the foundation of the state and many matters Irish, television was that strange child of ambiguous creativity, pinioned between national intelligence and national pragmatism, political and commercial forces. Too dangerous to leave broadcasting to the broadcasters. And then came the commemorations. Like Yeats's question, did that play of mine send out certain men the English shot? We might ask the same of Art E's 1966 anniversary programming. John Bowman, here present, records it as somewhat alarming that RTE's authority and senior editorial team had decided that the con commemoration was to be shown as a national rather than nationalist rather than a socialist event, and that the approach to programming would be idealistic and emotional rather than interpretative and analytical. There were eight newsreels nightly, one each night, called Insurrection, written by uh, Hugh Leonard. These were reports and reconstructions dramatized of what would have happened each day of the 1916 conflict. These newsreels were balanced by thoughtful interviews with descendants and relatives of the executed signatories and combatants. Most memorable and affecting among these was the remembrance of Nora Connolly O'Brien, James Connolly's daughter. She recalled the night before her father was executed. Her mother and she, as eldest daughter, were called to see him in Dublin Castle. He greeted them and said, well, Lily, I suppose you know what this means. And she said, but your life, James, your beautiful life. And he replied, but wasn't it a full life and isn't this a good end? It was a moment of real feeling. Without media, these moments and their insights would have been lost to our imaginations. And still later, RTE's great production by Tony Barry of James Plunkett Kelly's Trumpet City did remind people that there had been a Larkin and a Connolly and Irish women and men socialists at war with church and commerce associated with national pretenders. The many strands of Irish life and class were not forever with O'Leary in the grave. So, how well have our public media worked in informing, educating, and entertaining the mass about the decade of centenaries? I incline to the theory that there is no such thing as the mass. Rather, there are overlapping families of interest and attention, some with a similar intentionality, like all those varied, complicated parties <coughs> who strove for Irish liberty. What is undeniable is certain people's propensity to manipulation by elites. Nowadays, the mass, in effect, is a carefully delineated order of groups and subgroups to whom to sell things, ideas, wants, aspirations. In the old days, it was the church who generally held <coughs> the cards of totalitarian cultural power. The national illusion today is that these cards are held by government and opposition. The reality, perhaps, is that corporations and their electronic voices and technological uniforms structure everything. The last of the state's public media supports, TG Carr, opened in 1996, a lively and innovative addition to our media. Like every Irish broadcaster, it has engaged with the decade of communication of commemorations. TG Carr have broadcast programs about Tom Barry, Dan Breen, Ernie O'Malley, films on women's role, and directly on the Civil War. An independent film by Jerry O'Callaghan will be shown in December. Maru in Isha Kalkhi, Koga Sirshinu Koga Shekhtaf, Massacre or Murder in West Cork, Civil War or Sectarian War. RTE's TV's Nationwide has done almost 30 short pieces since 2016, historical reconstructions and remembrances, mostly by the redoubtable Donal Byrne. All commemorative events have been covered live and online by RTE. As for the Civil War itself, Neil Jordan's Michael Collins concerned itself in large part with the Civil War and the roles 
of Collins and de Valera within it. He recently said that he believes his treatment of Deb was not fair. Independent documentaries like The Limits of Liberty take on the state's conduct of the ideals of the rising and examine the extent to which we have carried these out, concluding that we haven't yet realized those dreams. In Keepers of the Flame, a full-length feature documentary, there's poignant evidence, evidence from some of the descendants of those thousands overlooked and impoverished by following the Republican vision and their ancestors. But chief among Civil War films that challenge our national sensitivities must be Kevin Lotus unapologetically socialist, the wind that shakes the barley. In one scene at mass, the priest thunders the bishop's belief in the virtues of the treaty and its promises of peace against the left-wing obduracy of the anti-treaty attitude. I suppose next you'll want to nationalize the 12 apostles. It's good to remember a major challenge, he said, by the way, <laughs> it's good to remember a major challenge to all film and documentary work. It's essentially expensive. It's essentially group work. As a small country, we cannot achieve the total financing for a feature or a documentary. It generally takes four or five or more financial partners. It's tedious, hard work. Nowadays, more and more, the state's application requirements can run to 25 pages of questions. The mania for reams of defense documentation is all pervasive. It takes a major effort to maintain a creative spark. No wonder people under 40 rarely look at television nowadays. Social media, the often hateful shorthand of social encounters, and drama series on other media publishers are the draw. But there is forever, thank God, beyond our silly hierarchies of class and power abuse, the awkwardly independent and charmingly irrepressible Irish spirit for ad hoc arrangements and for difficult truth telling. Yeats will always remind me of the persistent emotion of civil war at the Tower at Ballylee, of daily life itself perhaps. We are closed in and the key is turned on our uncertainty. One of the most compelling civil war memories this year is of Martin McDonough's moving, hilarious and brutal Banshees of Elishirn. The loving eccentricity of character, the rending of friendship, the self-mutilation and tragedy that ensues. In the vast grandeur of our countryside, that kind of remembering is thought-provoking, ethical, and magnanimous. Thank you.